What have we got here? These are the hydraulic power steering units, Rex. I thought I'd go over the information I got at the Central Service Power Steering Session with you and Dan. Tech is here to give me a hand. Thanks, Gus. Remember, you'll find this hydraulic power steering system on both Chrysler and DeSoto cars. That you do, Tech. Chrysler calls it HydraGuide, and DeSoto calls it Power Steering. And now let's take a look and see how this new hydraulic power steering differs from the conventional steering that we're all familiar with. Basically, it consists of adding a hydraulic pump and a power cylinder to the conventional steering gear. This gives the driver hydraulic assistance in turning the front wheels. Instead of a conventional one-piece steering tube and worm, this tube is in two parts, joined by a flexible rubber coupling. The lower part consists of a short shaft and spur gear mounted in a spherical bearing. The lower end is free to move up and down. I'll tell you why in a minute. The spur gear meshes with another spur gear on a shaft, which supports the steering worm. So you have positive mechanical control of the front wheels, just as in the conventional steering gear. Now, the spherical bearing permits the steering column spur gear to move slightly up or down the spur gear on the worm shaft when the steering wheel is turned. Without that two-piece construction, you wouldn't get this movement. That's right, Tech. This movement allows the valve operating block, which is attached to the steering column spur gear shaft, to move up or down, opening or closing the valves. That's how the oil is directed to the power cylinders. Now, suppose I go over the component parts briefly. Then we'll know what the different parts are when we start talking about how the system functions. Good, Gus. Where do we start? Suppose we start out with this pump and reservoir assembly, Dan. Are the units the same on the Chrysler and the DeSoto, Gus? Yes, the units are the same, Rex. However, there are some slight differences between the units installed on earlier and later production cars. What are these differences, Gus? Well, take this reservoir, for example. Two different types have been used but they are interchangeable as complete units. Notice this replaceable cartridge type filter element, Rex. This is the shorter type found on present models. Some of the earlier models had a higher element. Now, if you find one of them higher filters, replace it with a short one. I see you've got the oil pump disassembled, Gus. Hmm, two sets of rotors, eh? Right, Dan, these rotors draw oil from the reservoir and pump it through the flow control valve. This flow control valve, sometimes called a divider valve, is spring-loaded. Its job is to control the flow of oil in the system and return excess oil to the intake side of the pump. By limiting the oil flow to one and one-half gallons per minute, this flow control valve limits the pressure drop through the hydraulic system and limits the horsepower required to drive the pump. Good point, Tech. This pressure relief valve is also spring-loaded. Its job is to keep the pressure on the discharge side of the pump from going too high. You'll notice that there are different hose fittings at the pump than at the valve body. That's so you won't connect those hoses up wrong. Now let's take a look at this valve body assembly. Inside this valve body are four identical valves. One distribution and one reaction valve is located on each side of the valve operating block. You might say that this valve body assembly is the traffic cop of the system. The job of the valves is to route the oil to and from the power cylinders through the hydraulic tubes. What does this power cylinder do, guys? The pistons inside the power cylinders transmit the actual power to the steering gear, Rex. There are two power cylinders on the steering gear housing. Each cylinder contains a piston attached to the opposite piston through a connector, which gives them proper alignment at all times. And each one of them pistons is sealed by a combination piston ring made up of a T-shaped synthetic rubber ring backed up on either side by a pair of phenolic plastic rings. Each piston has a steel plug on its underside. Now the ends of these plugs bear against an arm attached to the roller shaft. When the piston moves, pressure on the arm rotates the roller shaft. Right, Tech, and that about covers the component parts of the power steering system.
Ready to find out how this system works? Shoot, Gus. First, let's cover the basic operation of the unit. Let's start out at the reservoir. Oil is drawn into the pump from the reservoir and is pumped under pressure through the system. From the pump, the oil goes through the two-piece flexible hose to the valve body. There, the valves direct the flow of oil to and from the power cylinders. That depends upon which way you are turning the steering wheel, doesn't it? That's correct, Rex. Here's an easy way to remember how the valves work and when. Always remember that the distribution valves distribute or send oil to the cylinder toward which you are turning. For example, when you make a turn, oil goes to one power cylinder through the distribution valve. The reaction valve, on the other hand, leads oil away from the opposite power cylinder. Get that, Rex? Mm, yes, I think I do. You mean that when we are making a left turn, oil is led away from the right turn power cylinder through the right turn reaction valve. Is that correct? It sure is, Rex, right on the head. So when oil pressure forces that piston to move in the power cylinder, it also moves the piston arm. This is your hydraulic assist, which makes driving a car equipped with power steering so effortless. What happens when the power steering system is in neutral, Gus? In neutral, the valve operating block holds the four valves partially open. With the valves partially open, oil circulates freely at low pressure through the system. Oil flows through the two distribution valves and their hydraulic lines to the two power cylinders and out through the other two hydraulic lines to the two reaction valves and back to the reservoir. That means that oil pressure is the same on both power pistons and the power cylinders so they don't move and no steering action takes place. What happens on, say, uh, a left turn, Gus? When the driver turns the steering wheel to the left, the spur gear on the end of the steering tube climbs up on the teeth of the worm shaft spur gear. This climbing action is caused by the resistance offered by the worm spur gear. The upward movement of the steering tube spur gear is permitted by the spherical bearing on the upper end of the shaft and the fact that this gear is free at its lower end. And remember, that valve operating block is also attached to the steering tube spur gear shaft, so it moves up too. As it moves up, it closes the right turn distribution valve and the left turn reaction valve, cutting off the flow of oil through those valves. As the valve operating block closes those two valves, it allows the springs in the opposite two valves, the left turn distribution and right turn reaction valves, to completely open these valves to the flow of oil. So, oil under pressure enters the left turn power cylinder through the open left turn distribution valve, pushing the piston downward. The downward movement of one piston forces the opposite piston down pressing the oil out of the right turn power cylinder through the right turn reaction valve and back to the reservoir. And this piston movement turns the arm attached to the roller shaft, which gives hydraulic assistance to the manual effort applied by the driver. You got it, Rex. When the driver releases pressure on the steering wheel, the front wheels return to the straight ahead position of their own accord. What about right turns, Gus? Do the opposite valves work then? That's correct, Rex. On a right turn, the steering tube spur gear climbs down the teeth of the worm shaft spur gear, causing the valve operating block to move downward against the opposite valves. It's clear to me now, Gus. I don't know about Dan. It's clear to me too, Gus. Say, I've been thinking about service problems. How do we diagnose complaints? I'm glad you brought that up, Dan. I thought I'd cover that next. Uh, just hold it right there, Gus. We got to turn this record over before you can give us the service diagnosis story. There are about three general service problems which can affect the operation of the power steering unit and which require further diagnosis. First, there is lack of assistance. Usually, this will mean that your power steering system fails to assist in making a turn. Second, you might get a noise during operation which can be traced to either the pump, the gears, or to some other part of the steering system. Third, you might get an oil leak caused by a damaged O-ring or seal, a loose hose, or a loose oil line connection. Or you might have a combination of conditions. 
Suppose we take a look at the boss's car. And I'll show you how to make accurate service diagnosis of some of the more common conditions. Let's start out with lack of assistance. What would lack of assistance mean to you, Dan? Well, probably lack of oil pressure. Am I right? That's one cause of lack of assistance, yes. And the best way to check pump pressure is with a gauge. Disconnect the pressure hose from the pump and install the pressure gauge with its shut-off valve between the pump and the pressure hose. Slowly close the shut-off valve. The pressure should build up gradually to approximately 600 pounds. Now, if it doesn't build up, maybe the pump drive coupling is broken. So you'd better remove the pump from the generator and take a look. If the coupling is broken, turn the pump shaft with your fingers a few turns to be sure it is free. Maybe it's binding, and that's what broke the coupling. Yeah, and remember, two types of couplings are used, so be sure the new one you put in is the same type as the one you took out. Good point, Tech. If the pressure builds up slowly, check the fan belt and generator belt tension. There should be between a half and three quarters of an inch deflection when you press on the belts between the pulleys. Now, if the pressure gauge registers only about 200 pounds, it's a pretty good sign that the flow control valve is stuck in the open position. What do you do about that, Gus? Disconnect the gauge from the pump and push a clean quarter inch probe against the valve. If it moves inward about 3 sixteenths of an inch, it was stuck open. So take it out and clean it up with crocus cloth. Reinstall the valve, hook up the gauge, and check pressure again. Now, if you still can't get a pressure reading higher than about 400 pounds, it means the pump rotors are worn or the pressure relief valve spring is weak. If a new spring don't fix it, you'll have to replace the pump. But if the oil pressure is okay, and you still don't get assistance from the power cylinders, open the shutoff valve and cramp the wheels both ways. And that pressure should build up on each turn to about the same as you got with the shutoff valve closed. Right, Tech. And if it doesn't, you may have a broken ring on one of the pistons, or trouble in the valves which operate during that turn. That means you'll have to take the gear housing out of the car and overhaul it. That brings us up to noise during operation, I eh, guess. Yep, being able to pick out the cause of a noise quickly will save you a lot of time. You may get some noise from the oil on a cold morning, but if you run your engine about three minutes before driving, that noise will go away. You know, I've been thinking about my dad's car. Every so often when I'm driving it, I hear a singing noise. What causes that, Gus? That's probably the pressure relief valve operating rapidly. And it's a warning signal that your wheels are cramped, and you'd better release the steering wheel a little so you don't heat up the pump. Tell them about them snapping noises you sometimes hear when you're making a turn, Gus. Will do, Tech. Actually, these are hard to locate if you don't know just where to look. You can correct most of them without removing the steering unit from the car. For example, a loose piston arm on the spline of the roller tooth shaft will cause a noise. This means you'll have to remove the access plug from the lower housing, loosen the lock nut, and tighten the set screw with an Allen wrench. Then tighten the lock nut. And of course, you'll want to check the usual linkage connections, drag link and tie rods, and intermediate steering arm, as well as the gear housing to frame mounting bolts. Backlash between the worm and roller tooth can be adjusted in the usual manner with one added operation. Be sure to loosen the piston arm set screw on the roller shaft so you won't crowd the arm against the side of the piston connector. Be sure to tighten that screw when you've made the adjustment. Better tell them how to adjust the spur gears to get rid of a rattle on straight ahead driving. Right, Tech. That adjustment's pretty easy, but it's important. Here's how you do it. Then you get in the car and pull up on the steering wheel and hold it up while I loosen the adjusting plate lock screw. Now I'll move the plate clockwise until it will hold the steering wheel up without you having to hold it. Okay, Dan, you can release it now. Then I'll turn the adjusting plate counterclockwise very slowly. What happened? The steering wheel snapped down in place, Gus. Good, that's what it was supposed to do. 
And right at that point is where I tighten the adjusting plate lock screw. Then I know the spur gear adjustment is right. If you hear a groaning noise when the engine is running at slow speed, and the noise increases to a whine as the engine's speed increases, it's probably caused by scored or damaged pump rotors or shaft bearings. That means replacing the complete pump. Can you get noise from the steering tube coupling, Gus? Yes, if the coupling screw is loose. To tighten that, however, you'll have to remove the steering tube from the car because that screw is inside the coupling. And that brings us right down to oil leaks, don't it, Gus? Yeah, and most of the leaks are caused by loose connections or attaching screws. For example, drain plug gaskets, the pressure relief valve plug, and the hose adapters on the oil pump and reservoir. And I suppose between the bottom of the reservoir and the oil pump. Right, just tighten the screws in the bottom of the reservoir. Another spot might be between the cylinder lock rings and the housing, because the lock rings aren't tight. Tighten those with a spanner wrench. If it still leaks, it probably means the O-ring is damaged and will have to be replaced. You can replace the seal at the end of the roller shaft if it is leaking without removing the gear housing from the car, too. That's right, Tech. You'll have to remove the starting motor and, of course, remove the pitman arm. Next, remove the snap ring and then remove the seal with the special tool. Be careful not to scratch the roller shaft. Press the new seal in with the special sleeve and install a snap ring. I suppose you'd get a leak if the fittings on the ends of the tubes between the valve body and the power cylinders aren't tight. Right. But don't use too much muscle. Use a socket wrench and pull them down to the right specification. That's right. And check the hose connections, too. You'll find torque tightening specifications in the reference book for every point on this unit. If you notice an oil leak at the bottom of the gear housing, it means that the hydraulic oil is leaking into the worm and roller compartment. In that case, you'll have to take the unit out of the car and replace the seal between the valve body and the gear housing, or the roller shaft inner seal. Whenever you disassemble the unit, always use new O-rings and seals on the part you've disassembled. Well, that about covers the description, operation, and diagnosis of the power steering system. You'll find more details in the reference book, of course. Better look it over pretty carefully. But that's not all of the story. I'll be back again, and we'll go over the how of removing the unit from the car and overhauling it. Be seeing you. <laughs>